Okay, it is 11 on the dot. And we are just getting our live YouTube started. And we are saying good morning to a bunch of different people coming on here. And we are lighting our candle. our candle of, of unity and light. Welcome to the Community Church of Boston. Welcome to our auditorium. Um, both uh, both uh, folks joining virtually and folks joining physically. We have some uh, very uh, special honored uh, guests who are, are here with us. We wanna uh, invite any of you who, uh, when you feel ready to, to come back and be with us uh, physically in this space in Copley Square, because it's a beautiful place. And because I need an excuse to, you know how they say that you, you only clean your house when company arrives? Well, that's what I need. This is becoming too much of Dean's man cave and it's not okay. So please come down and, uh, and join us and revel in the, this wealth of books that we have probably temporarily with us here. Some we will stay here, but, uh, but many of them, most of them probably will go elsewhere from the um, Bob Dottilio collection. Welcome, welcome. We have a wonderful program this morning. We are joined first and, and foremost by Asliani. She joins us from Joshua Tree National Park uh, vicinity. And um, it's such a pleasure to have you back, Asliani. You have joined us numerous times in, in recent memory, both physically and virtually. And we're so glad to have you here from such a beautiful place, which is in full bloom in the desert. Um, I have a memory of the California desert from my college years at Pomona where, where I took a plant classification class and the botany professor who had written a textbook on flowering plants of the desert would take us in a bus uh, an hour east into the desert and uh, we'd, we'd scramble out of the bus and he would sit, uh, he, was, he was in his 80s, uh, Mr., uh, Professor Benson, and he would sit and we would, we would bring our flowers to him and he would help us classify them and uh, help us show in the textbook where the description of the plant was. And it was just like a brown desert turned into a, a painted, gorgeous, colorful beauty. So I have just incredible memories of of the desert and my memory of Joshua Tree National Park is when my buddy Bob Salskoff and I went in his beat up camper, which was overheating. And um, <laughs> about an hour before we got to uh, um, Joshua Tree, we both dropped a piece of blotter acid LSD that would be and um, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a wonderful thing I, I saw in in the in the Joshua Tree National Park Desert, many things that probably aren't even there. <laughs> and my buddy Bob had a horrible trip and thought he was dying so it was sort of like I had this blissful thing that was canceled out by my friend's bad experience. Uh, anyway, um, those are my Joshua Tree memories, and we are so glad to uh, to welcome you here. And I want to sing uh, a cappella, a little song that reminds me of that same rugged desert where life hangs by a thread. Um, this is a song called Bristlecone Pine. Way up in the mountains on the high timber line, there's a twisted old tree called a bristlecone pine. The wind there is bitter, it cuts like a knife, it keeps that tree holding on for dear life. But hold on it does, standing its ground, standing as empires rise and fall down. When Jesus was gathering lambs to his fold, the tree was already a thousand years old. 
Now the way I have lived, there ain't no way to tell. When I die, if I'm going to heaven or hell. So when I am laid to rest, it would suit me just fine to sleep at the feet of a bristle cone pine. And as I would slowly return to the earth, what little this body of mine might be worth would soon start to nourish the roots of that tree and it would partake of the essence of me. And who knows but that as the centuries turn, a small spark of me might continue to burn as long as the sun continued to shine down on the limbs of the bristle cone pine. Now the way I have lived, there ain't no way to tell when I'm die, if I'm going to heaven or hell. So when I'm laid to rest, it would suit me just fine to sleep at the feet of bristle cone pine, to sleep at the feet of a bristle cone pine. Mm. Astiani, good morning. Good morning. Amen. That song is so beautiful. I found it very, very moving. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, um, that, that song feels very fitting for this environment where I live, where I feel somewhat like that pine, to be honest. Um, it's a tough terrain. It's a tough terrain. And, um, you know, you having this super blissful, amazing trip and your friend having this really horrible one, I feel like it's a place where there's great light and great shadow and a fine line between the two. And, um, but I'm very, very blessed to live here, grateful to live here, grateful the, for, the, for the ways in which it's making me grow. Um, and I want to acknowledge that I'm on the um, unceded lands of the, the traditional lands and the unceded lands of the Chemuevi, Kowia, and um, Yuhaviatam and Marengayam, Marengayam um, peoples. The, the last two tribes I mentioned are um, often referred to by their Spanish name of Serrano. So I am on their lands and I am deeply grateful for their stewardship of these lands. And I'm humbled and honored to be here today. Yes, and I'm originally from Boston, Mass. I grew up in Brookline, Algonquin territory. And um, it's been um, a long way from home. And it really means a lot to me that you guys invited me to be here today. So I'm gonna open up with one song and um, then um, share a few more with you guys a little later. Um, yes, so I guess I'll just go ahead and get it. Um, get it going here. All right, so this song is on my album, which is yet to, yet to come out. It's called The Goddess Room. Um, <clears throat> in my spiritual walk, there's a few different threads. There is a very strong biblical thread. I walk with Yeshua. There is an indigenous thread. I walk, I am a daughter of Mother Earth, and I also um, honor the divine feminine and the divine masculine. So the song's called The Goddess Room, and I'm going to do it. Yeah, so introduce myself. Okay. And I wrote it in 2020, just as things were starting to go down. Asliani 2020, it's been a minute, but I've been coming and I'm money. I've been taking time to get in touch with my tummy, recouping everything they took from me. I was just a little, little youngie when it began, and I'm still on the mend. From the ravages of man, I got some poison inside. I won't deny it for a sec, but for the triumph of the light over darkest, I rap for the healing of the human family. Yes, I ride. I know we strong enough to face what's really inside. Divide and conquer works well. There's mad mistrust. I thank the goddess that she's still inside of us. She tough enough mm, to weather the storm. She has been scorned, stuck with thorns. In the lonely dark forest, she has sojourned. She has more and is reborn. And now we're summoning you to the goddess room. Time to go boom, and it's time to make it bloom. I gotta take it there, cause the big mama thing. I didn't come here to shake my ass for y'all and sing. Mm. 
Now I came to say what's up. I came to say what's up. And to honor sacredness as such. Asliani 2020. It's been a minute since you got an album from me. Can't rust the process, me, I cook slow. Cause between my projects, I gotta grow to become more of the woman who I am in my rhymes. It's work and it's full time. I've been learning more about what it means to walk with respect. Yes, the equals up in here, nobody more nor less European and Jewish from the first experience. Boston, master, New Mex, never trying to front like I'm nothing I ain't, but there's a lot of colors on my palette, so I paint. Apologize for my flavor, I can't. But yes, indeed, we got to talk about race. I'ma see you on the next verse. I'ma take a breath and pray about what I'm about to express. Yes. Now we're summoning you to the goddess room. Time to go boom, and it's time to make it bloom. I gotta take you there, cause I'm big mama thing. I didn't come here to shake my ass for y'all and sing. Mm, mm, mm. Now I came to say what's up. And I came to, have to talk about some things that's hard to touch. There's a Z on my chest, that means I have to earn it and show up with humility to my learn. And there's a Z over my heart, I gotta walk my talk, give everything I got to take the walls apart. I'm here on native land, taking my stand, coming in large with all that I am, native brothers and sisters. Yes, I ask for your permission to write here, click into position. African American peace. Yes, yes, I pay my dues to your strength and your culture and your struggle for survival. This music's born of an experience. That's not my own, but it's in these tones that I bring it on home. Do you feel me? Y ahora mi Latino gente rapeo en español, but I ain't copying your identity. Respect for your struggle and for your culture too, which in my life has been so beautiful. And I pay words of gratitude, honor, respect, and love to my people who gave me my life. Jewish, English, Finnish, Irish. I do not love that we've been colonizers upon this continent, but I love my blood. Summon you to the goddess room. Time to go boom, and it's time to make it bloom. I gotta take you there, cause I'm big mama thing. I didn't come here to shake my ass for y'all and sing. Uh, now I came to say what's up. I came to say what's up and to honor sacredness as such. Okay, then. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Asliani. It's beautiful, beautiful you. introduction to you and to where you are and to where you're from. That was lovely. Well, folks, uh, welcome. I want to tell you, first and foremost, that we have this newsletter that's still new. Be glad to send you a copy of it in the mail if you still communicate that way. You can also find it on our website and um, and you can uh, ask us to add you to our, our mailing list uh, where we tell you everything that's coming up. I'll give you uh, a little taste. Um, next Sunday is um, Kristen Waters is a professor from Worcester State University and she's talking about an abolitionist named Maria W. Stewart. It's called Maria W. Stewart and the Roots of Black Political Thought. Uh, the, the author is Christian, Kristen Waters. Um, and music that day by Reggie Harris. If you've never heard Reggie, he's a legendary uh, songwriter and performer. Um, and it goes on from there. All kinds of wonderful programs coming up. I also want to tell you about this next Sunday is April Fool's Day. And we have... A uh, uh, new tradition we're starting. Um, April Fool's Day is Community Church of Boston's highest of high holidays, we have determined. Uh, and um, to that purpose, I found just by accident this book uh, in um, amongst uh, the thousands of books that are suddenly in our auditorium now. And this one is called The Fool. His Social History and Literary History by Enid Wellsford, The Fool. Um, we're gonna find out a lot more about that this, this Sunday because we're gonna celebrate um, our high holiday with Don White. He's a master comedian, songwriter, humanitarian. 
I love the music and the shtick of Don White from Lynn, Massachusetts, born and raised, proud Linner. Uh, and will you join us? It's this Sunday. It's by the way, it's this same link. Um, it's a concert and you're welcome to buy a ticket all proceeds to to the performer, as have been all of our winter Friday concerts. Uh, they started in December and um, this is the last one, um, because winter is is over. And we're so glad about that. Um, as as way of um, Talking a little bit about what's going on here, I, I want to start with Don White's book. It's called, among all these scholarly books, it's called Memories of a Sea Student, Don White. Um, really funny book. Uh, and you can get a copy of it, and, and he'll, he'll tell you about himself and about his, his, um, his adventures in in comedy and in um, and in songwriting here's some quotes uh, this one is from his wife this thing better make lots of money mrs white and this is his daughter my father used the word neoplatonist in this book he has no idea what that word means and this is his son. I knew this book was going to be a pack of lies as soon as I saw the title, because my brother was a D student. I guess it's his brother, Michael White. Anyway, Don White, this, this Friday, 7 p.m. on this same link. Um, next, I want to, there's a gazillion different periodicals and um, uh, different publications that Bob uh, Dottilio uh, subscribed to and never threw away a single one of them. And this one, uh, a lot of it is just uh, amazing stuff that'll go in the, uh, and be good kindling in the fireplace. But this one was just great. It was, it was Mark Twain reflections on religion. And it would be good for, for April Fool's Day that because that's when you celebrate irreverence, uh, you celebrate um, heresy, apostasy. Um, Mark Twain would fit right in there. And I just started reading this. I'm not going to read it to you, but it's it's just he was he was like it was like three years before he died, and he dictated this in in a couple of days to somebody who just took it down. And um, he also gave instructions that it it couldn't be published until a hundred years after he, he died. Uh, which would have been 2006. So, um, but this was published, it was published 100 years it, it, before the 100 years passed because this publication is 1964, uh, 1963. Uh, it is, it's, it's very funny. And um, he also published some other stuff that he said couldn't be published. He, he wrote some stuff that he said couldn't be published until 500 years after he died, which would be like the year 2406. Um, Mark Twain, funny, funny guy. You can find a bunch of Mark Twain books here. F. Scott Fitzgerald, Ernest Hemingway, this many Ernest Hemingway, this much uh, like poetry like you wouldn't believe, on and on and on. I wanna show you another book that just came in. Chris Hedges spoke here um, a, few, uh, a few months ago um, and um, gave a wonderful talk uh, which has garnered about 36,000 views on our YouTube channel, by far the, the, biggest, um, uh, the biggest viewing of, of any uh, of our YouTube um, offerings, which there are many, many. You should check out, all, all the concerts are there and all the, all the Sunday talks. You can um, fast forward the boring parts like Dean blabbing about nothing and go straight to the speaker. Um, but this is about Chris's, uh, students in, in prison uh, where, where he teaches college courses. And um, it's by way of telling you uh, an amazing thing, which is that uh, we got word that this Tuesday, one of our members behind bars, Lee Underwood, will be released. And um, it, it was sort of sudden news and uh, uh, we're gonna go down and pick him up and uh, promise to as a church, be uh, one key support in oh, this, the success of 
his parole, which is a very difficult thing. I don't know if any of you know about parole, but it's often so many demands on a person who's already vulnerable that it's, it's sort of a setup for failure. Lee Underwood, we're looking forward to welcoming Lee to, uh, um, to the church and to uh, help figure out that thicket, which is parole after you've been behind bars for a long time. Finally, a, a book that I've just been totally um, both angered and, and amazed by, it's called Injustice, the Story of the Holy Land Foundation Five. These were five Palestinian Americans who were very successful businessmen and started uh, what, what became the, the most, uh, the, the biggest Muslim charity in the world that supplied, let's say in the United States, I'm sure there's bigger Muslim charities in the Arab world, but supplied um, uh, aid to uh, refugees in Palestine and especially aid to, uh, to children in Gaza. And in the aftermath of 9-11 became targeting in, in the need for, for a, for some kind of uh, an, an object of the, the wrath of a nation became targeted and, and pegged as a terrorist organization, uh, despite their incredible efforts to, to go completely by the book and to reach out to the US State Department and Department of Treasury and say, this is what we do, this is what we want to do by the book. Still, they were, uh, they were indicted and are now spending enormous long amount of time in jail. And um, it's an injustice that reminds me of Sacco and Vanzetti, truly. It, 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 reading this book, and I recommend it to you all, Injustice, Miko Peled is a um, Israeli uh, American speaker who has uh, joined us a couple of times as well. Miko Peled, um, Injustice, the Story of the Holy Land Foundation Five. Finally, one more and only one more book, which is our regular readings, Eduardo Galeano, Children of the Days, Uruguayan uh, author, columnist, and historian who wrote in, in many times in these vignettes. And I love just finding what's going on for that day. And today is the 27th and I have not re read it yet. March 27th, it's called World Theater Day. And uh, I will mention to you that we have like six boxes of, of books on theater uh, because Bob D'Atilio was way into theater. He was a stage manager for, for a lot of theater and music. Um, World Theater Day. In the year 2010, the public relations firm Murray Hill Incorporated told the politicians who claimed to govern to stop play acting. A short while before, the United States Supreme Court had removed all limits on corporate donations to electoral campaigns. For a much longer while, the bribes legislators received from lobbyists had been legal. Applying the same logic, Murray Hill Incorporated launched its own candidacy for US Congress in the state of Maryland. It was high time to do away with intermediaries. Quote, this is our democracy. We bought it. We paid for it. Now it's time we got behind the wheel ourselves. Vote Murray Hill Incorporated for the best democracy money can buy, unquote. Many people thought this was a joke. The words of Eduardo Galeano. We have a whole bunch of his books over here as well. Come see us. The auditorium is, is your auditorium. When you feel safe, come visit. Crystal, our publications manager and I are generally here Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And um, I'm here Sunday mornings, of course. Um, this is your place. You come on Sunday mornings, as have several today. I want to welcome, can I go the right way to, to get uh, Dick Crowley 
Dick, we are just so overjoyed that you are here. Dick Crowley, a longtime member of Community Church, has been away from, from this auditorium for uh, over two years. And um, just really happy to have Dick here. Dick was our president uh, uh, for several years during not the easiest of times for the church and, and its history. And um, he was just such a strong leader. And we're just so happy that you're here with us with his sister, Dr. Dr. Barbara Crowley, who is right over there. Um, we also have Eli Sussman with us here. So um, join us at church. It'll be a, a hybrid kind of a, a, an, an event. We've, we've realized the importance of continuing this transmission to people who are shut in and can't, can't be with us physically for whatever reason. So um, please do join us and we will figure out how to do this with elegance, grace and style as will be displayed with our wonderful performer again that uh, will, will give us a couple of songs we call the, the musical message. Asliani, take it away. Well, hi again, thank you. It's such, such an honor to be here. Um, yeah, so I wasn't totally sure. I, I gave myself like a bunch of possibilities of song to do and I've just been in prayer about which ones to do. Um, and I'm just uh, trusting, right? Because that's that's what we got to do. Just uh, trust that, just ask to be guided and 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 follow what comes and trust it. Um, so I'm gonna do a few songs. Um, so this first one is a, is a short little one, and um, it's called "Take Your Corona Back." Uh, corona meaning crown. And um, I wrote this at the beginning of the pandemic, you know, when everything was just starting to hit, I had this strong, strong sense that this was really like a spiritual wake up call for humanity. And that um, it's just um, like time for us to like, just the strong, strong conviction and, and the need to speak of it that, um, that the, we are most powerful in our fights for justice in our work to transform this planet. Um, standing strong in our in our power as divine beings and calling in the just endless divine help because um, our God is a God of love and mercy and justice and um, Jesus came for the poor. <laughs> um, so this is a song I wrote uh, called Take Your Corona Back and I'll do a few after that. About the need for peace. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, here goes. We are master peace, because yes, we need release from our worried minds down, down to our feet. They've been having our consciousness in cages, the terror paradigm, they've been pushing it for ages, but you're a masterpiece, you're the master of your peace. No choice in the matter, we got to go deep and find what it is that we gotta release and lay it all down at our creator's feet, regardless of our concept of him and her. What matters is we stay communing on the regular, keep our head up and give thanks for every blessing and go to him and her first with all of our stress and practice good hygiene and strengthen the immune and maybe think about bringing in a new tune. Tomorrow's not promised, but no, it never was. It's the same choice as it's always been, fear or love. Turn off the TV, don't feed that maggot brain. Everything will be provided if we just switch lanes. He's right here, he's got us by the right hand. She loves us at a level beyond what we can understand. We can change the vibes. Let the judgment slide. Give acceptance to whatever's inside. Maybe we got some things we really gotta say. Mother, Father, God, show us how in a loving way. It's the coronavirus, so take your corona back. Stand up, breathe deep, and get your prayer on track. Get the healing of everything alive. Baby, yes, yes, it's time. It's the coronavirus, so take your corona back. Stand up. Breathe deep and get your prayer on track for the healing of everything alive. Yes, it's time. 
Yes, it's time. Uh, sending this out with gratitude, with a prayer for protection for all the peacemakers, peace warriors all over Mother Earth, past, present, future, with a prayer for peace in the hearts and the minds of the spirits of all humanity, with a prayer for justice in this world, with a prayer that love may reign, because love is the ultimate truth. Amen. Thank you. All right. Um, so this next one, thank you. So this next one's called Indigenous Mind. And I wrote this back in 2014 and it was on my last album. And I mentioned earlier that there is a part of my spiritual walk is biblical and, and, and it's also indigenous. And I'm, um, uh, that's, that's who I am. I have to walk both ways. I do not have indigenous uh, blood that's indigenous to this continent. Um, but in my, I have been so blessed to have been taught uh, Lakota ways. Um, that was actually my introduction to, to uh, um, that was how spirituality came into my life was through um, traditional Lakota sweat lodge when I was living in New Mexico and um, extremely deep experiences and uh, um, walking that way, I came to really connect with my own indigenous roots um, coming from um, European indigenous people on my mother's side. So this song is called Indigenous Mind, but very, very important, right? We're always learning and growing. I certainly am. I recorded this song saying, give me my indigenous mind. I don't like that lyric anymore. So that's not how I perform it. Um, and the reason, there's a couple of reasons. First of all, you can't be given an indigenous mind. I mean, come on, this is like, you know, that's the product of a lifetime of work to recover, um, recover a mind that can be truly present. Um, and furthermore, and this is very important, like I descend from, from some of the first English colonists in, you know, on these lands, um, like no more gimme gimme coming from settler descendants upon this continent. There's been quite enough of that. So now um, I, I perform the song, show me my indigenous mind. So I'll be drowning out the chorus with the show me. Yes. And it's a prayer. It's a prayer. It ain't no noble savage myth, it's a simple acknowledgement that regardless of the color of your skin, not too long ago your kin uh, lived in a way that was deeply connected and natural law, yes it was respected, it's not a mental concept alone, it's an ability to listen to stone and to listen to wind and feel the heartbeat of the earth, veneration of life, cycle, sex, death, birth, a way of living that's in tune with the essence where the natural world has your full attention. That's how all of us come into the world, but before long, they get us all in the world. And before long, most of us lose it because they value obedience over attunement. Show me my indigenous mind. Show me, show me my indigenous mind. Dying. Fighting to the nail for mine. Run around the same laps in my mind. Oh, oh, show me my indigenous mind. Show me, show me my original mind. Birthright of all humankind to know life outside of mental mind. But a person who felt fully alive, who breathed deeply and felt good inside would never accept life between the lines of the new fear-based paradigm. So they made a point to cut us off at our root, proclaim themselves the soul keepers of the only truth around the sexual, emotional natures and shame. And if you disagreed, you were thrown to the flames. Feminine power could no longer exist with its connection, emotion, playfulness. Half the world now, now, made to submit. It was basically zip it or die, which in indigenous ways were now considered a crime. And the rest was just a matter of time. The white man made by holy Roman design went out to repeat the conquest and brutalize. Show me my indigenous mind. Show me, show me my indigenous mind. I Fighting tooth and nail for mine, run around the same laps in my mind. 
Show me my indigenous mind. Show me, show me my original mind. Birthright of all humankind to know life outside of mental mind. Now, I'm not saying that everybody's experiences have been the same in the current paradigm. No. As a result of the forces of church and state colonizing Europe first and the way history proceeded, the power, the privilege, the resources continue to be in the hands of white people. The point I'm making in this song, though, is that all of us come from people who are deeply connected and the vast majority of our human ancestors did live indigenously all over this earth. And they're right here with us, wanting to see us come back to a connected way of living. Yes. So that I may feel tingle in my spine, show me, show me my indigenous mind. So that I may see what's in front of my eyes, show me, show me my indigenous mind. So that I may know freedom from time. Show me, show me my indigenous mind. So that I may be ready when I die. Help me remember my indigenous mind. I hate <sighs> Thank you guys. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to do one more song. One more song for y'all. Just let this beat ride out. <sighs> All right, just go right into it. Rainbows, rainbows, Genesis 913. I have affixed the rainbow in the cloud as an everlasting reminder of my covenant with the earth. I've um, heard another interpretation saying, um, as an everlasting reminder of my love for you. I like that one better. Here we are. Here we are on the verge. Can't give up, gotta work. Play our part in the overhaul to restore beauty and evolve. We took it on from the other side. Ancestors are on our side. As above, so below. Sickness of planet, sickness of soul, I give it away. And then I take it back. Can the water creatures dwell? Scary, scary, they attack. As my learning, I stack. Uh, oh, daddy, yours is mine to unpack. Through it all, though. I fight to keep it clean on the mission to regain my throne. Yes, but I am queen. Just cause something's bad. That doesn't always make it wrong. Learn the lessons, make amends, dust off and get on. Daughter of Earth, reclaiming her worth, digging down, down deep in the dirt of the curse to find my gemstones and put them in my crown. Grown up and driving my own ship now. Gotta maintain on the goddess plane. Excise the poison from my brain. Patterns, patterns rearrange. They would never mind. I do contain rainbows. 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 Gotta maintain on the goddess plane. Excise the poison from my brain. Deep friend those demons in my terrain. They just scared I do proclaim rainbows. 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 Rainbows, catch a book. In the gas chambers, I reclaim my goddess power. How to get through that final hour. How to live in the heart and not in the mind. And break out of the clutches of the fear. Vine, divine mother, open the portal of self-compassion. For this woman child, known to some as Catherine, lead me to true forgiveness of myself. And into the palace of my inner wealth. Oh, yes, ma'am, I'm taking my stand, throwing up my hands and making demands. I plant my feet on the mother and I look them in the eye and let what must with the end I die. Oh, yes, I am coming round the curve. There and here they are, the fruits of my work. But it's only worth doing if it's helping set us free. I want to get to the bottom of what's between you and me. Uh, gotta maintain on the goddess plane. Excise the poison from my brain. Patterns, patterns rearrange. They were never mind. I do contain rainbows. 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 Gotta maintain on the goddess plane. Excise the poison from my brain. Befriend those demons in my terrain. They just scared her to proclaim rainbows. 
Rainbows. Rainbows. Rainbows. Keshetot. Keshetot is Hebrew, Hebrew for uh, rainbows. Yes. The line I say in the gas chambers, I reclaim my goddess power. That is heavy. That comes from a dream. I, I had that happen in a dream. And my father's side, I'm Ashkenazi Jewish, lost many family, much family I know in that um, horrible genocide. And uh, so that's where that line came from. Yeah. Sending out rainbows, divine love to the world. And um, thank you guys. That, that's, that's what I'm going to do for now. Thank you so much. All right, Asliani. Thank you for that little window into your spiritual path and your soul. It's just incredibly nice, beautiful, wonderful, honest. Folks, we have a very special program today. Um, and the reason I say that is because I hope that there is a lot of cross-pollination here. Um, we are missing in this building the influence of LGBT folks. We had a most amazing tenant that was a, a cooperation and a relationship of, of um, 12 years. They were called Theater Offensive and they, they were maybe eight, between eight and 10 employees that worked in this building uh, for all that time and that used this auditorium for their rehearsal space. They were called Theater Offensive and um, they, still exist and they're doing great and they're going into a new space pretty soon in a brand new building on Boylston Street near the Fenway uh, that's not completed yet uh, but um, we miss them very much. Another tenant that we have that uh, that went away because they got their own space was called Bagley, Boston Area Gay and Lesbian Youth. Um, our presenter this morning comes from the History Project, and it turns out we're neighbors. Uh, their space is uh, just uh, three blocks away from here, and uh, they document and archive the history of Boston's LGBT community, struggles, celebrations, all of that. And uh, Joni Lacqua joins us with an amazing uh, resume that, that I want, to have here with us. <laughs> Why? Because we have an entire fifth floor that is um, laid out with the church's archives, 102 years worth um, that go back to 1920 when we were founded uh, all the way till, till now to our 100th anniversary, which was uh, sort of the parade was rained on by COVID, but we, we decided that we'd keep on celebrating forever and keep on celebrating ourselves and our, and our amazing, radical, difficult, strange history in this city. Um, I wanted to just talk about a little piece of that history uh, by way of introduction. Um, exactly 90 years ago, March 25th, there was a... Um, a speaker who was going to be here, and her name was Helen Keller. And she was going to join us, but she was suddenly uh, struck ill. I was in the, in the archives uh, last week for a whole different reason. And um, uh, um, I found this, this little piece of uh, in, uh, newspaper article where Helen Keller, not being able to be with us, sent a message for spring and sent a message uh, that was read by a Dr. Cabot, a Harvard professor, uh, on her behalf in uh, the, um, the service for that day, March 25th, 1932, um, uh, where um, she was she was going to speak and, and she's, he sent this address. And I just want to read the very last uh, paragraph just to remember Helen Keller, who she was, deaf, blind, and still an amazing uh, anarchist and socialist activist. Uh, here's, here's what that paragraph says. 
we were not created, some of us to labor, suffer, and want the rest to get and spend and waste the works of man's hands. We were created all to belong to each other, to increase with our work, the comforts, the knowledge, the joy in the world that will be our highest resurrection when we rise out of selfish and separate interests into sympathy and mutual aid, out of wars and jealous fears into peace, out of the limits of nationalism, class and creed into the boundless life of the race, out of materialism into the kingdom of God. That's from our archives from Helen Keller. And with that, I welcome Joni Lacqua. Hi, Joan. Hello, thank you so much for having me this morning. Um, it is absolutely my pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, zooming in from my, my home in Waltham, so not as far away as Joshua Tree, and I think the scenery is not as gorgeous, but uh, still pleased to be able to, to be here on this spring morning. Um, I have a presentation to share, so I'm going to share my screen. All right, we can see that. Awesome. Um, and yeah, I figured since I, I have you all here, um, I'd like to talk a bit about LGBTQ history in Massachusetts to share some stories about LGBTQ community members um, who we know about throughout history and um, some information about the history project and, and what we do. So <laughs> because I'm a public historian, I have this broken down into a, um, an outline of some different time periods we're gonna look at. Uh, but before we get to that, I just wanna uh, introduce myself and the history project a little bit more um, deeply. The history project is a, a community-based independent archives. Um, our mission is to document, preserve, and share the history and stories of Boston and New England's LGBTQ communities. And we share that history with LGBTQ people, organizations, allies, and the general public. Um, our office is in Back Bay, so we are down the street, uh, right across the street from, from Back Bay Station. If you're interested in Boston gay wayfinding, we are down the alley from Club Cafe. Um, but uh, in our office and, and in our organization, we maintain one of the largest LGBTQ archives in America. We have about um, we have over 200 collections of materials from organizations, from people who are part of the community, and those range in date from the 1940s. Um, our earliest materials are uh, pre-Stonewall, mostly uh, photographs and videos of private parties um, all, um, all the way up to today. And within the archives, we have all kinds of ephemera and documents and correspondence and t-shirts and buttons. And, um, you know, basically if you have uh, an interest in LGBTQ history or community, feel free to reach out because we probably have something where I can point you in the right direction. Um, I'm a, a public historian and archivist. I, I serve as the executive director of the History Project, and I'm our only employee. We're a volunteer-driven organization. Um, and in my role, uh, it's my job to illuminate stories that have been hidden or ignored. Um, I am a white cisgender lesbian, so while these are stories of our, our entire LGBTQ community, um, I recognize my privilege in being able to do this work and highlight parts of our, our community story that have been difficult to trace over time. Uh, I tend to use the word queer, but that's because I'm a millennial. Uh, people in the past likely didn't consider themselves queer. They didn't use that word. Um, in most cases before the mid 20th century, we don't know how people may have identified. Um, but in the, the stories that I'm gonna share today, you know, some uh, queer, gender non-conforming, trans history um, was going on here in Massachusetts and New England. Uh, a lot of my sources come from a book called Improper Bostonians, which was put out by the History Project in 1998, as well as newspapers and other records contemporary to the, the time periods I'm looking at. And I'm always happy to offer suggestions of books and podcasts and uh, if you'd like to learn more, and I invite you to check out the History Project website where we have digital archives and exhibits as well. Um, our organization started in 1980. 
a group of activists, historians, and archivists came together and decided that they wanted to find evidence of queer people throughout history. And at that time, uh, most mainstream archives, most university archives, uh, if they were collecting queer materials, were not describing it as queer, were um, actively <laughs> sort of obscuring or hiding um, the identities of the uh, people who had created the records, but we knew, and, and these group, this group of people knew that there were people who were part of our community's cultural history out there. So they did the research, they encouraged others to uh, document their own history, to tell their stories. They created a slideshow back in 1980. Um, and, and from that first action, uh, created the archives, began to collect records, and now, um, we've grown enormously and continue to do this work to ensure that uh, the story and histories of this community that have so long been denied to LGBTQ people that are not part of um, mainstream education that are under attack around the country and around the world right now um, for inclusion in schools um, is available to us and available to all who are interested. So, uh, when you're looking at the screen here, this is one of our first flyers from 1980, uh, right there on the left. Starting back at the beginning in Massachusetts, or the area, the land that became or was colonized as Massachusetts, um, you're looking at two images here. One on the left is um, two-spirit activist Geo Sakmata Neptune. On the right is an engraving of um, Captain Miles Standish and his men observing the, the Marymount community. Um, in Massachusetts pre-colonization, we know of Native American and indigenous communities who had same-sex relationships, depending on the tribe or group, people who we now might use modern terms like gender fluid um, or trans to describe uh, how they move through the world. Um, prior to the Puritans landing in Massachusetts, and we know that nations of Native people lived across America and continue to live across America before colonizing the land now known as Massachusetts. Tribes included the, the Massachusetts, Wampanoag, Pawtucket, and others in this area. Um, it is really hard to trace pre-colonization Indigenous queer history, um, partially because the records that do exist tend to be written by colonizers. Um, and uh, Regardless of that difficulty, um, Native communities have reclaimed and reasserted and kept alive um, specific queer identities. Um, one, uh, which is specific to Native identity but not coined until 1990 is the term two-spirit. Two-spirit is considered an umbrella term for Indigenous people who have both masculine and feminine spirits or um, uh, <laughs> neither or both really depends. Um, not all trans native people consider themselves two spirit, but uh, it is a term that has um, been reclaimed and, and used again. Um, and although 400 years of colonization and white supremacy have tried to erase and assimilate native people, um, others are, are keeping tradition alive. Geo Sakmatan Neptune um, is a member of the Passamaquoddy tribe. Uh, which is in Maine, but <laughs> is local to New England. Um, and they're the first trans person elected to public office in Maine. So I like to point at them and their work. And I encourage you to go uh, look them up. They have a very active social media presence. Um, in 1620, the Puritans fleeing religious persecution in England first landed in Provincetown. They settled in Plymouth. They established a Christian settlement with strict rules and roles within family and society for men, women, and children. Um, in 1629, the Plymouth Militia overtook Thomas Morton's Marymount colony um, because of quote unquote blasphemous activities. Marymount was in, in modern day Quincy and um, people who were part of the colony included former indentured servants, Thomas Morton, Native American people. And in, um, William Bradford's history of Plymouth Plantation, he says, quote, they set up a maypole drinking and dancing about it many days together, um, dancing and frisking together like so many fairies or furies and worse practices, as if they had a new revived and celebrated the feasts of Roman goddess Flora or ye beastly practices of ye mad Bacalanians. 
Um, the Plymouth militia chopped down the Maypole, arrested Morton, he was put into stocks, um, marooned on a desert island, and then uh, sent home, essentially. Um, so Puritans during this time period were really interested in um, the basically community uh, morality. So super early statutes and, and queer people that we know about from this time period are ones who were arrested or um, charged with committing blasphemous activities. Um, 30, 1636, we have uh, sodomies and buggamy, buggery listed among uh, offenses punishable by death in the New Plymouth colony. Um, 1641, another law which included, if any man lieth with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed abomination and shall surely be put to death. Um, this kind of same-sex attraction was considered moral degeneracy. Punishments were imposed as penance. Um, because sodomy, according to the Puritans, would provoke fire from the heavens on the entire community and not just the people engaging in, in sodomy. Um, so the people we know about from this time period are people who were written about, not people who wrote about themselves. They include people caught having sex with members of the same sex, um, who were caught cross-dressing um, or doing other things that we would probably consider kind of queer today. When we get to the Revolutionary War, we start to see more records of people um, who we know a little bit more about. We're still reading between the lines. Um, specifically in Massachusetts, the two people I wanted to mention are George Middleton and Deborah Sampson. Um, Sampson's image is on the right. She uh, wrote a book, and that's the front piece from her book. Uh, she just disguised herself as a man and joined the Continental Army in 1782. Um, she used the name Robert Shirtleff, which was the name of her deceased brother. She fought in several battles. She was injured. Her quote unquote true sex was found out. She was honorably discharged and later in life wrote a book about it. Um, she petitioned to receive an army pension and for her husband to receive spousal benefits. And she got those. Um, her biography from 1797 implies that she had romantic liaisons with women while she disguised herself as a soldier. Um, she's never particularly overt about this. After the, after she was found out, she went back to dressing in feminine clothing and presenting herself to the world um, and moving through the world as a woman. Uh, so it's difficult to know <laughs> what she really thought about herself and, and about gender, um, if she actually had relationships with women or if she was kind of playing up the story as she um, told it later in her life. Uh, another woman, Anne Bailey, uh, also mustered into the Continental Army from Boston. Um, she was caught immediately and uh, was put on trial and forced to pay a fine for cross-dressing. So these sorts of things were kind of going on. Um, George Middleton, on the other hand, uh, and there's no image of George Middleton in existence. Instead, I have the, the flag of his... Um, Revolutionary War unit and a picture of his house. His house is the oldest extant house on Beacon Hill. Um, Middleton, whose birth year was unknown, was the leader of the Bucks of America, uh, which was an all black Revolutionary War regiment. And Middleton built the house picture in 1787. Uh, he built it with his good friend uh, and hairdresser, Louis Clapion. And according to some historians, uh, Clapion and Middleton lived in this house as a couple for four years, um, and then Clapion got married in 1781, and they split the house in two. And um, it's hard to tell if Middleton married. Um, there's a marriage record that, that is in one church, but she, her name, the name of the woman, is never listed in the home. Um, he was very involved in Boston's Black community. He was part um, he, uh, of uh, benevolent, benevolent societies and um, other activities to support the Black community on Beacon Hill. Um, after splitting with Clapion, um, he ends up becoming close friends with Tristam Babcock, who was a mariner. And upon Middleton's death in 1815, he left his entire state to Tristam. Um, we're reading between the lines here. It's really hard to know because Middleton didn't talk about his relationships. He didn't write about them. Um, we 
don't know uh, if he was actually in a relationship with these two men or if he was just really good friends. Um, but something queer is kind of going on here and, and reading between the lines suggests that he may be part of our community's history. And I think that's important to point out, especially during this time period where um, people couldn't be out, the, the punishment for being out, for being public, um, included you know, corporal punishments or fines or both. Uh, on the other hand, we have some really uh, public folks from this time period as well. Um, the public universal friend who unfortunately was not from Massachusetts, but is from Rhode Island, um, has a really well-documented and important story. So the friend was born in Rhode Island in 1752. Um, we know their birth name, but that is not the name they went by in the latter part of their life, so I won't use it now. They were raised as a Quaker, and in 1776, they contracted a disease that historians think was typhus. They were bedridden, they were near death with a high fever, and after that fever broke after several days, the friend awoke and reported that their former self had died and their soul had ascended to heaven, but the body remained with a new spirit charged by God to preach his word. And from then, the person used the name Public Universal Friend. They refused to answer to their birth name. Uh, they asked not to be referred to with gendered pronouns. They dressed in a way that was considered androgynous or sometimes masculinely. Uh, they began to preach and they gained a following. And the two images here on the left is a painting of the friend. On the right um, is a print from uh, a book a plate of the friend. Um, they their followers referred to them as the public universal friend, the friend, or the PUF. Um, and when the friend was asked if they were male or female, they responded, I am that I am. In the 1790s, the friend's followers built a separatist religious community in upstate New York. And um, after the friend died in 1819, their followers remained in upstate New York in this colony until about the 1860s, as eventually they um, <laughs> dispersed. But what I think is so exciting about the friend and about their life is that it is exceedingly well documented. We have clear evidence of how they perceived themselves, about how they presented themselves in the world, how they talked about themselves and thought about themselves. Um, and there's a, sort of a suspicion that this is because of the religious work they did, that they were given an amount of social leeway, um, having had an, an ecstatic rebirth um, by God. But they're really early example of somebody who is um, transgender or gender non-conforming, um, who essentially has the opportunity to write their own story and live the life that they want publicly. Continuing to head through Massachusetts history, we have a number of authors and poets and artists who were part of our LGBTQ community. Um, I like to joke that basically everyone you read in high school um, is on this list, or many of the people you read about in high school are on this list. So going from left to right, we have Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, influential thinker, poet, transcendentalist. In his journal, while he was a student at Harvard, he wrote about his obsession with another young scholar named Martin Gay. Um, he waxed poetically about him. Uh, and even though Emerson edited and removed portions of his journals later in life, um, he had a crush on this guy for about two years. And his journal included sketches of, of Martin and entries about Martin. And it's really clear evidence of, of his interest um, and attraction. Henry David Thoreau, best known for Walden, uh, is next on my list. And it's unknown if he ever acted on his thoughts about other men, but you, again, there's evidence of it in his poetry and in his personal writing. Um, in 1839, he wrote a love poem called Lately Alas, I Knew a Gentle Boy about someone with whom he spent the summer. And it's really romantic. I'm going to quote it for you. So was I taken unawares by, unawares by this? I quite forgot my homage to Congress. Yet I'm forced to know, though hard it is, I might have loved him had I loved him less. My next two on this list are connected. Um, Herman Melville and Nathaniel Hawthorne. Um, although Hawthorne's in the, the center, Melvin's, Melville's on the right, I believe. Um, they, 
Melville had a, a brief and very intense infatuation with Nathaniel Hawthorne. Reportedly, Hawthorne ignored his attention, um, and Melville was crushed by this. Um, Melville wrote a poem about it, about the loss of his love, um, and it was said that Melville had an eye for handsome young men. So if you've read Moby Dick, and read between the lines. You can see some of this intense male uh, interest and attraction. Um, finally, Emily Dickinson uh, from Western Massachusetts was really intense in her ardor for several women throughout her life, including her sister-in-law, Susan Gilbert, later Gilbert's childhood friend, Kate Scott. And she also wrote a poem about a night together with Kate in 1860. Quote, her sweet weight on my heart a night had scarcely deigned to lie when stirring from beliefs to light, my bride had slipped away. And the majority of Dickinson's po poetry was made available after her death in 1886. Um, her family didn't realize she was so prolific, but uh, many of her poems were heavily edited by her family to remove reference to her female love. So there are several artists um, from the, the mid 1800s um, who were, I think a little scandalous. Um, starting from left, left to right, you're looking at Edmonia Lewis and the middle is Harriet Hosmer. And then on the right is an image of Charlotte Cushman who's standing and then uh, Emma Stebbins who's sitting in that photo all the way on the, the right. Um, Edmonia Lewis was born in about 1844. She was of Black and Ojibwe Native American heritage. Um, she often mythologized her early life uh, when she became an artist and talked about it. So we're not sure exactly when she was born, um, but she really, she talked about the influence of um, being born Native American, um, of spending her, her childhood um, outdoors, uh, in reality, she was born in upstate New York. She spent a lot of her childhood in Newark, where I'm sure she could have also been outdoors. Um, but she had a relatively secure upbringing. Her brother had struck it rich during the California gold rush. But she describes herself as, quote, until I was 12 years old, I led this wandering life, fishing and swimming and making moccasins. I was sent to school for three years, declared to be wild. They could do nothing with me. Um, the records of her grades exist. She was actually a really wonderful student. <laughs> Um, but this was part of her, her storytelling about herself and um, the, the way in which she explained the influence for her art later in her life. Uh, and Moni attended Oberlin, where she experienced extreme prejudice as one of only 30 students of color and one of very few women of color. Um, after several infident incidents, uh, one where she was accused of poisoning her classmates, it seems like she probably snuck in some alcohol and, and got them drunk and then got in trouble for it. Um, she ended up leaving college and she ended up in Boston. She wanted to be a sculptor, um, which was an art form dominated by men, in particular white men. And after being turned down by several sculptors uh, as an apprentice, she worked under Edward Augustus Brackett. Um, and he specialized in marble portrait busts and that became her medium as well. Um, her, uh, in, um, 1864, I believe she, she created a bust of Colonel Robert Goldshaw of the 54th Regiment in Boston. Um, and that gave her enough uh, cash to leave America. Um, she joined, uh, a circle of expatriate, uh, sculptors and artists in Rome headed by Charlotte Cushman. Um, Cushman, who was an actress, was born in Boston. She appeared in um, many theater productions, often cross-dressing as a man. And she oversaw a feminist international colony in the, the 1860s in Rome. Um, Cushman had many lovers, many of whom we know about because she was very publicly entangled with several people, including Emma Stebbins, with whom she's in, uh, photographed, uh, Harriet Hosmer, um, and others. And so Edmonia joined their cabal in 1865. And she declared, quote, I was practically driven to Rome in order to obtain the opportunities for art culture and to find a social atmosphere where I was not constantly reminded of my color. The land of liberty had no room for a colored sculptor. We don't know entirely what Edmonia's uh, sexual orientation was. She, um, 
claimed at one point to be engaged, but never said to who. Um, she hung out with a, a bunch of women who we would probably call lesbians now. Um, and she gained international acclaim for her work during her life. If you'd like to see some of it in Boston, um, it adorns the graves of several people in Mount Auburn Cemetery. Um, she died in the early 1900s, and for a long time, her, her work was lost to history. She's become, um, people have become interested in her again. Her sculptures are now in collections at the Smithsonian, uh, limited edition US, Park, our U.S. Postal Service stamp just came out with ammonia on it, um, and we're learning more and more about her life now. We also have very specifically to Boston, uh, Boston marriages. So a Boston marriage was a partnership between two women who had the means to support one another. From the outside, they could look like deep friendships um, and some of them may have been, but others were definitely relationships. The first time the term was used in 1886 in the novel, The Bostonians by Henry James. Um, and the couple that he's talking about were influenced by his sister Alice and her partner Catherine. Um, some examples of Boston marriages are between author um, Willa Cather uh, and Edith Lewis, who are, are pictured on the right. Um, on the left is an image of Annie Fields and Sarah Orne Jewett, who lived together as partners after uh, Annie Fields' husband died. Um, after his death, she and Sarah Orne Jewett, who was an author from Maine, became lifelong companions um, for several decades. And uh, in Annie Field's memoir, uh, she talks about her relationship with Sarah. Um, although when her memoir was published post posthumously, they edited those parts out. I believe the original is still at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Um, but again, we see this kind of uh, censoring of, of queerness and of queer love and queer relationships. Um, Willa Cather and Edith Lewis similarly were partners for uh, almost 40 years. Um, uh, Lewis graduated from Smith College in 1902. She went home to Lincoln, Nebraska, where she met Willa Cather, and they uh, stayed together for the next almost 40 years. Um, they lived together in New York. They shared a summer cottage in New Brunswick, Canada. Um, and they lived together until Cather's death. Um, when Lewis died in 1972, uh, she was buried beside Willa Cather in Jaffrey, New Hampshire. And then um, I have a, a story that's very local to Boston. Um, about someone whose name uh, is Ethel Kimball. Um, I use the name Ethel because that's the name that this person used most often, um, but they are the epitome of the mean be gay do crime. So um, the, the story goes in, in December of 1921, John Hathaway was arrested on State Street and he was charged with stealing an automobile. The police officers soon found out that John Hathaway was in fact Ethel Kimball. Um, Ethel had spent the previous two years masquerading as a wealthy widower and graduate of MIT. And uh, in those two years, married a, a woman named Louise A. Schler from Somerville. Uh, when Ethel was arrested, uh, they came out to police and said, actually, I'm a woman. You wouldn't hit a woman, would you? Um, and when they were arraigned in court, police brought Ethel women's clothing and Ethel refused to change. Um, Ethel claimed that I wore men's clothing because I wanted to approach life's problems from a man's viewpoint, especially the problem of unemployment. Um, Ethel and their story is very well documented in newspapers um, from about 1911 through 1930. Um, they had a long track record of dressing as a man, committing crimes, getting arrested, being found out, uh, being sent sometimes to jail, sometimes to medical institutions. Um, they stole cars, they passed fake checks, they checked into hotels using fake names and then didn't pay the bill. Uh, in 1924, we know that Ethel married Pearl Davis of Parsonfield, Maine, um, but the couple was turned into the authorities by Davis's nephew, who was like, something's going on here. Um, 
And despite serving time, despite being caught, Ethel continued over and over again to live their life um, as a man. It's really hard to know how Ethel thought of himself or themselves, um, basically because they never wrote about themselves. The only records we have of them were written about them, um, either by newspapers or by uh, doctors or by uh, other um, professionals. And it's unlikely they thought of themselves as trans, basically because the term didn't exist at the time. The term didn't exist until the 1960s. But Ethel's struggles and efforts to live as a man imply that they understood themselves as a man and acted accordingly. And so um, Ethel is one of my, my favorite Bostonians. Like I said, they were um, pretty infamous uh, throughout this, this about 20 year time period. Um, and eventually they moved to New York City and the, the last record we have about Ethel uh, is from the early 1930s and it's authorities in New York writing back to Boston saying, we just picked up this person and they say they're from Boston, do you know anything about them? And Boston authorities saying, oh yeah, we know a lot about them. Um, Ethel eventually kind of disappears to history. Uh, we don't know what happened to them, where, where they ended up, and it's my hope that they um, were able to kind of blend in with the crowd in New York and live life as the way that they wanted to. And finally, um, I'm bringing us up to about Stonewall today, um, and I'm skipping ahead to post-World War II. So after World War II, um, lesbians and gays who'd served in the military or worked on the home front um, began to, to meet and create a community with one another. Um, most of the people that I've told you about up to this point, with the uh, exception, I think, of the public universal friend, are really kind of one-off stories of people or of couples. Um, but after World War II, um, we begin to see this burgeoning national gay community um, that leads to the gay liberation movement. Uh, so uh, after World War II, lesbians and gays were dishonorably discharged from the military during what was called the Lavender Scare, which was a moral panic where queer people who were considered national security risks or communist sympathizers were rooted out. Um, there were threats of blackmail, exposure, public censure, imprisonment, and so this gay community retreated to bars and private homes, uh, both of which could, could be and were raided. And in response, two organizations formed um, and, and fostered this nascent public gay community. One was the Mattachine Society, which catered to gay men, and the other was, was the Daughters of Belitis, which catered to women. Mattachine was established in Los Angeles in 1950 by Harry Hay. Uh, its name was inspired by medieval French mask groups who would meet secretly and through their anonymity, criticize ruling monarchs. Um, I've heard that they chose the, the name Mattachine and that it doesn't mean anything, um, but I'm not sure how true that historical that, that is. Um, the Boston chapter of Mattachine began meeting at the Parker House Hotel in 1957, and it was started by Prescott Townsend. And so Townsend is in the image on the, the left. Um, he is the older gentleman who is second from the left in this uh, image. And um, Townsend was a Boston Brahmin. He was from a very prestigious family. Um, he attended Harvard. He served in the Navy during World War I. Um, he was a patron of the arts in Provincetown. And he was pretty out for, his, uh, for this time. Um, basically because of his privilege. He, he could afford to be um, eccentric, artistic. Um, and during World War II, as part of the war effort, he took work at a Fall River shipyard um, where he was caught in the act with another man. The two of them were charged with committing, quote, an unnatural and lascivious act. Um, Townsend, although he had the money, refused to pay the fine. And so he spent 18 months in prison on Deer Isle. And this imprisonment is considered the impetus for his later organizing. Um, after World War II, he spent the rest of his life as an activist and organizer. He established the Boston branch of the Mattachine Society in uh, 1957. 
Um, and he began to meet with other gay men. Manishin was concerned with uh, unifying homosexuals, education about homosexuality, assisting oppressed gay people. And um, Townsend and his uh, privilege and, and trust fund essentially um, helped the Boston burgeoning gay community. It said that he paid for the printing of the first Christopher Street Liberation Commemoration Flyers in 1970. Um, after he was, was found out during World War II, his name was literally struck from the, the social register in Boston and Massachusetts and, and New York. Um, but he continued to be out and proud and, and trying to make change in the world. Um, we know from his, his Harvard, uh, goodness, the word just went out of my head, his Harvard reunion report, which is uh, something that Harvard sends out to their uh, graduates, asking them to report on what they've been up to. He talks about his active activism and his political life later in his life. Um, the Daughters of Belitis, on the other hand, they were founded by Del Martin and Phyllis Lyons, who are um, pictured in the, the middle here. And in 1955, they are interested in creating a safer alternative to finding community than in bars. Um, they wanted to meet with other women. Uh, at first, they called themselves actually gender variant women. The term lesbian wasn't as in vogue in 1945 as it became later on in the liberation movement. Um, but the mission of the organization shifted to from being a social club to providing support to women afraid to come out, um, to providing information about their rights and their history. Boston's chapter was established in 1969, and early leaders included Lois Johnson, Sherry Barden, and Laura McMurray. Um, the Boston chapter lasted through the early 2000s and uh, continued to serve as both a social group and an organization that focused on personal support for lesbians, education of the public on lesbianism, and lobbying to reform laws limiting the rights of les lesbian and gay men. Um, these organizations are part of what we call the homophile movement, which was an early organizing effort of LGBTQ people in America. Um, these move, movement organizers set the national stage so that after the 1969 Stonewall riots, uh, commemorated or coordinated efforts to commemorate the uprising took place. And that's where I'm going to leave you today is with Stonewall, actually. Um, in 1969, uh, in June, the Stonewall Inn, which was a, a small, relatively seedy bar um, in New York City, was raided by police, which was a typical thing that happened. Um, but the patrons of the Stonewall Inn um, fought back against the police. Um, skirmishes continued in the neighborhood over the next week. And um, although this wasn't the first time that gay people fought back against uh, police or fought back after a raid of a gay bar, um, it is the one that really sparked a uh, public movement for visibility and acceptance. Um, starting in June of 1970, Christopher Street liberation um, commemorations occurred, uh, which would later be called Pride. Uh, in Boston in 1970, we held a series of uh, basically educational activities, classes, support groups, conversations, and a gay dance. Um, in 1971, we marched. And so uh, a group of organizers started at Jacques Cabaret and stopped at four sites, um, reading a list of demands at each one. Uh, for support of the gay community. At Jocks, they asked for or demanded uh, support for people going to bars. They demanded um, uh, more space for lesbians. They demanded um, safety. Um, and they continued on to Boston's uh, City Police Department, which then had been on Berkeley Street, where they demanded support from police rather than harassment. They continued to the Boston State House, where they demanded that uh, laws that dated back to the Puritan <laughs> times be removed, that laws uh, that were vague about lewd and lascivious behavior or loitering weren't used to harass gay people, um, and they demanded equal rights. They then stopped at St. Paul's Cathedral um, on the other side of Boston Common, where they asked for equality in religion. 
that they asked to include uh, women in religious organizations, and they asked for gay couples to be accepted as straight ones were as well. Um, and then they ended at the Parkman bandstand on Boston Common with a uh, ceremonial closet smashing um, and a book burning of uh, books by psychiatrists that were saying that gay people were you know, mentally ill. Uh, pride marches and rallies have continued in Boston since then, with the exception of the last couple of years with COVID-19. Um, but, you know, it's, we're part of a, I think, a movement of um, or, sorry, my train of thought completely went out of my head. Um, we're part of, a, I think, a um, community history and connection across time that uh, the things that we have been fighting for since the earliest days in Massachusetts are things that we're still fighting for now. Um, the world is a lot different than it was in 1969, uh, but there are still organizations out there that are fighting for equal rights for trans people, for um, inclusion of LGBTQ history and curriculum, uh, for inclusion of LGBTQ books in libraries and schools. Uh, you know, we, we have marriage equality in Massachusetts. Massachusetts was the first state to um, uh, have gay marriage in 2004, but there's still a lot of work to be done and a lot of organizations out there that are doing that work. And um, <laughs> it's never ending, but it is also very exciting. So, that's where I'm gonna leave us. Um, I just wanna say thank you again so much for having me here today. Um, I am available for questions. I know this isn't really like a question <laughs> venue since we're streaming on YouTube, um, but if you have any questions for me, please feel free to reach out at infohistoryproject.org. That comes straight to me and I am happy to suggest other resources, point in the direction of, of original materials or historians doing this work, um, or even organizations that are doing work uh, on the ground now to ensure equal rights and protections for all of us. Uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Joan. I hope folks can hear me. Uh, uh, there was a, a major um, uh, computer malfunction happened here and I'm joining you from my phone. Um, can you hear me, in fact? Okay. Um, well, I will proceed as if uh, there was nothing happened. We, we lost you in the middle of that. And Joan, I'm looking forward to, to really hearing the whole thing on our YouTube channel later on because we missed a good part of it. And it was just really fascinating and, and amazing. Uh, I want to say that um, Part of this new trove of books that we have here is, is a, a large um, section of books about Boston and Boston history and New England history photographs. Now, I think that a, a, a perfect and appropriate complement to that would be books about exactly this, this topic, LGBT history. If you can suggest a few titles, maybe we would uh, seek to acquire those to add to our existing collection from the, the, uh, the estate of Bob D'Atelio. Um, so um, I want to say that this is the moment when we say to all of you that, that we rely on your uh, contributions and your support to make this happen. This is your house. Uh, and um, we welcome any uh, material um, help that you can offer us. Our website is communitychurchofboston.org and you can uh, use your credit card or your PayPal account there. You can also send us checks the old fashioned way, 565 Boylston Street right here in Copley Square. The zip code is 02116. Um, Asliani. Will you take us out with a wonderful song? And uh, after that, we will have some questions and answers. I hope that Charlie can uh, take over with the Q&A, uh, monitor the chat, both on the YouTube channel as well as on the Zoom. And uh, because, because I'm a little bit um, uh, disabled by a, a computer that's malfunctioning, hopefully I'll be back together with everything by the time we're done here. But if not, um, so uh, Asliani, Thank you again for joining us and uh, the Zoom is yours. <laughs> so
Spotlight Asliani. Okay. All right. One more song. One more song. Um, thank you so much, Joan. That was really super fascinating and really enlightening. I really, really enjoyed that presentation. I learned a whole lot. I'm really, again, say I'm really very, very honored to be here today. And uh, go out with a song. <laughs> What to say about the destruction, how they eat in Mother Earth like a luncheon and munching on everything sacred and licking the plate. Give us a wide ass grin why they lying in our face. But this just in, we can't command the miracles, says Mary Magdalene. We Phoenix children creating heaven on Earth, releasing our shame and showing up for the work. Uh, are you with me? Then good, let's rise. Children of Mother Earth and Father Sky, let's do the work we gotta do to deeply align and let what must wither and die, die. Oh no, it ain't no thing but an overhaul. We sick of playing small. These suits don't suit us at all. We shedding our skins now, bearing our teeth, being made anew and seeing through new eyes. Ain't it sweet? I'ma hit them with a dose and speak of our need to get close to the most. Hi. Uh, I'ma hit him with a dose uh, and speak of our need to get close to the most high, high. yeah. Uh, and so many so focused on marketing themselves, but too much can repel when abundance is wells. Yes, we gotta find the way to make our album sell in alignment with the spiritual wealth and with the new truth. We rewriting the rules. We cooler than cool, but this ain't middle school. Nah, homie, it can't be about looking good. How can we do that and still keep it hood like we should? You see, I like it raw because in me there is a tigress who must roar. Also an eagle who was born to soar and a unicorn too, she can open up a door. They will not stop us with violence because yes, we filling up the silence with soul sounds rich and warm. Been kept inside real long, but they knocking on the next level. You who ding dong, and speak of our need to get close to the most high. I'm a hit him with a dose. Uh, and speak of our need to get close to the most high. Yeah. We walk the line between the dark and the light. We came to Mother Earth right, right on time. Rainbow generation, where we at? We find in the old ways, they show us the map. We walk the line, we walk the line. Take our demons down one, two at a time. We are bit by the snake. We jump in the <laughs> transformation, not escape. Es otra relación con el presente. Que requiere que le preguntemos a nuestra gente. Contamos con la ayuda de los antepasados. No importa si esclavos o quemados por paganos. Lo que tenían en común es respeto. Por madre tierra, papá cielo y los elementos. Y mucho más allá que eso. La manera de sentir la magia de este momento. Those who speak of a need to get close to the most. Ah. Hey, yeah, I'ma hit him with a dose. Uh, and speak of I need to get close to the most. Hey, hey. yeah. Uh. All right, I'm gonna go out like that. Thank you all so much for allowing me to share my heart and my words with you today. Really, really deeply appreciate it. It is an honor and um, blessings to you all. Shalom. Asliani, thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. And join us physically when you find yourself in Boston again. Yes, it won't be too long. I mean, my family's there. So, you know, it's only a matter of time till I'll be back there again for a visit. And I would love to come see you guys in person. Yeah. All right. That was incredible. Um, so let's open it up for any questions, uh, comments, observations. The question 
is for Joan. And uh, the, the question from, uh, from the auditorium here is, uh, where is the history project located here in Boston? And is it an archive that's um, open to the public? Can you make an appointment and, um, and pay a visit? Yeah, so we're, we're by appointment only, um, partially because we're, we're volunteer staffed most of the time, and partially because of COVID, we, we aren't in the office every day. But um, if you're familiar, we're at 29 Stanhope Street, which is across the street from the backside of Back Bay Station. Uh, Stanhope Street is kind of a short sort of alley uh, between Clarendon and Columbus. And Dartmouth, I think, if my, uh, yeah, I'm not the best at visualizing maps, but I think that's between, exactly where we are. Between Clarendon and Berkeley. Yes, there oh, we go. Yeah. Those are the, uh, those are the two streets. Stanhope runs perpendicular. There we go. And it goes in alphabetical order, which I know, but I can't keep that in my head for whatever reason. Um, <laughs> if you're familiar with the Boston Living Center, we're in the same building as them. We're up on the fourth floor. Um, but yeah, if, if, um, Send me an email if you're interested in coming by, and um, we can we can make an appointment. Um, we'll also be doing we're doing a lot of virtual events right now. So if you want to connect with us, our next is April seventh with an author uh, Isaac Fellman who wrote a book called Dead Collections about a trans vampire archivist. <laughs> so I'm really looking forward to. I haven't read it yet, but it sounds it's getting really really good reviews. Um, and we'll also be doing some walking tours this summer. We, we walk that first route of Boston Pride as one of our tours. Um, we also do a, a gay Beacon Hill tour and a, a walk around Boston Common, sort of pointing out and talking about all of the intersections of gay history with our very long and very deep Boston history. So that's where we are and how you can find us or a couple of different ways to find us. That's fabulous. I'm going to make an appointment with you and and pay a visit. And um, I hope that we can re-engage with LGBT Boston um, now that Theater Offensive is elsewhere and Bagley is also elsewhere. Um, I don't know if you remember Jason Lydon, who was our minister for, for quite a while. Did, have you, I mean, this is the first time we met. Have you been uh, in Boston community long enough to remember Jason? So I know, I know of Jason, um, but I've never met him, but I am an enormous fan of black and pink. Um, yes. I am, I am, Michael Cox is, is amazing. Everyone who works at black and pink is amazing. And yeah, someone I mentioned I was doing this talk and a friend said, oh, yeah, he was involved with uh, Jason Lydon was involved with the Community Church of Boston. And it was like, it's a small world. Um, but yeah, we have some of the the black and pink materials in the archives. Um, and we also have there was a, a Boston, they called it the Prison Pen Pal Project that uh, was started by Oh goodness, my coffee's not kicked in. I'll think of his name as soon as we're off the Zoom, but it was started by somebody associated with Gay Community News. And we have that original collection as well, which is kind of a, in, in some ways, a precursor to the modern work that Black and Pink does too. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, I love Black and Pink and it's so exciting to hear other connections to the work that they do. And folks who, who don't know, Black and Pink is, is an outreach to imprisoned LGBT folks. And it's a massive pen pal project. And they also um, publish a newsletter that goes out to quite a few thousands of people behind bars. And Jason was one of the, the founders, Jason, who we hired uh, recently out of prison. <laughs> for having uh, protested down at the School of the Americas in, in, in Georgia, um, spent six months in federal prison, got out, and that was a badge of honor for us to, to hire him immediately at the age of like 23 years old. It was remarkable, uh, uh, wise beyond his years, had a remarkable run with us while he was in seminary, and he was ordained. And uh, that was 2012. And Jason said, 
I'm out of here. I can get a real job now. <laughs> um, but uh, the, you mentioned Michael Cox and um, I, Michael has presented here as well. And the, the other thing is that we still, I think we must be listed uh, as a resource in, in some kind of handbooks or whatnot for, for black and pink, because we still get tons of requests. They come in every day uh, from people who are looking for pen pals or, or who are wanting to connect with black and pink. And we now put them in an envelope about once a month and send them off to the, the headquarters of black and pink now. Um, it's, uh, it's a marvelous thing, but our, our name is still listed in some kind of prison-wide handbooks that maybe goes to libraries and whatnot. Um, and uh, we're glad to do it. Maybe someday it'll, it'll, it'll go off that, that handbook. But um, um, yeah, Michael Cox, who I need to be in touch with because we are looking at a, uh, a possible event. And this is a, an event called Release for the Captives, maybe a uh, possible name for it. And the reason is that we've had in the past couple of years, three of our members behind bars, long-termers who have uh, been released. And one of them will be released this Tuesday. And it's a, a really joyous thing. And we're hoping to get them all together, at least two of them physically, but and one of them um, by Zoom, that would be Arnie King, a remarkable um, man who spent 40 plus years in, in prison and is now home with his family caring for his elderly mom. Um, so Michael Cox, uh, I want him to be in the, um, in, in the picture for, for, for that event. Um, uh, before we say goodbye, I see that Dan the Bagel Man is joining us and uh, I want to uh, uh, feature him First, I want to show him what I want. I have something for you, Dan. Dan, who feeds many, many homeless people on the streets and, and who is, uh, owes, we owe him one of these posters right here uh, because his, which he, he displays on, on his car and at his, at his stand where the homeless get fed, uh, got stolen or destroyed or something. Anyway, I have a new, a new little image for you, Dan, and, and I'll show it to, to the world here if I can. Um, Pin myself here so you can all see it. Um, here it is. Uh, and I I don't know if people know what the what the uh, the the reference is there, but that is uh, from a, a certain representative named Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was who, who was. Uh, Complaining about the gazpacho police that uh, that uh, attacked the the January sixth demonstration, where she was. Anyway, this is this is for Dan, gazpacho police to protect and serve soup. Folks, we're coming near the end of of our uh -huh. event today. Dan. Oh, Dean. Uh, oh, Charlie. Yes. I have a, a small question. I yeah, know yeah. I've. I've heard a talk by uh, Jer Jerry, and I never know the best pronunciation of his last name, Scapitulo, who was a radical yeah. um, about the history of uh, the gay left. And I was wondering if uh, if you have a section on the gay le uh, left in, as part of your collection. We have several collections um, that are, are part of the, the gay left. And Jerry has done a talk with us I think about the, the connection between gay people and the Coors boycott. If I remember, it's pre-COVID, so it's been a couple of years, but I believe yeah. that Jerry, Jerry Scopatulo came in and did a talk on that. Um, but yeah, no, we have, uh, uh, what is the organization? I think it's, it's Blagmar, I think is what it's the, um, the initialism is, but it's gays and lesbians against the right. We have, um, uh, one thing that we collect that are uh, not as big as like, some people donate things and we have like the papers of Charlie Shively, who was a, a huge activist um, known for uh, his really explosive pride speech in 1978, where he uh, ended up burning his draft card, his insurance card, his Harvard diploma, and then a Bible, um, which was met with mixed reviews at the time. 
we have his papers, which is like a, a collection of uh, 13 to 20 boxes. Um, off the top of my head, I don't remember. And then we have what we call subject files. And there sometimes we'll get a single pamphlet from someone or somebody will drop something in the mail for us. Um, so we have a lot on, on organizing and um, sort of groups that have had huge impact, but not that many records. So like we have a Kambahi River Collective subject file. Um, uh, we have subject files on um, some of the, the more recent Black Lives Matter and trans resistance and other organizations active now. Um, but yeah, so if you're interested more, I feel like I'm just kind of giving you a laundry list, but if you're interested more on that topic, feel free to reach out to me and I can, I can tell you more about what we have when I'm in the office. Um, yeah, we, we try to make sure that we are doing our best to document all of LGBTQ Boston. Um, uh, and in particular now we're doing a lot of work with communities of color to ensure that they're, and trans communities to ensure that their stories are, are part of the story, um, part of the archives so that they, um, so that historians have the opportunity to write about <laughs> these parts of our community as well. Um, but I'm rambling. So yeah, Jerry Stapatulo is a really amazing resource as well. Um, and I'd reach out to him and see if he'll do something on Zoom with us. That would be really fun. Jerry, who is also a fine piano player and has, has joined us um, not in a while. It's, it's been, it's been uh, quite a few years. I see Dan's hand is up. Hello, Dan. Hello. Um, quick question. <clears throat> you talk about... Um, Jerry, and I recommend, I don't know if you know her, but I hope you have, is Kathy Hoffman. She's run the Cambridge Peace Commission. Do you know her? I recognize her name, but I don't know if I know her personally. I recommend she is part of Boston history in many ways, not just gay issues, but other issues. Mm -hmm. She's been at the forefront of activism in Boston for many years. Like I said, running the Cambridge Peace Commission uh, a few years, she got her in contact with many other people, activists. Cambridge Life Black Lives Matters is one of her things she's very involved with. Cambridge Black Lives Matters. So she's very involved for years in activism, teaching workshops on civil disobedience and peace, social justice. So, Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. And, and that's something, too, is um, we each year... Uh, give awards to folks who have been doing work who haven't been acknowledged necessarily or, or acknowledged as deeply as we think that they should be. Um, and I'm always glad to hear more about folks who like, you know, I'm one person, so I don't know everyone, but um, I'm always excited to hear about work that's going on in the community. So thank you so much, Dan. Yeah, I will ditto that about Kathy Hoffman, who uh, whose, whose work I know about is uh, with the, Cambridge, El Salvador, San Jose Las Flores Sister City Committee, where she's one of the founding members from 1986 and still just very much at it. Just this past uh, week was the uh, commemoration of the assassination of Monsignor Oscar Romero. And there were five women who did a sponsored walk in commemoration of his assassination in 1980. Uh, Kathy Hoffman, um, deserves every award coming to her. Not that I have any uh, pull in that regard with your organization, but but there you have it, Kathy Hoffman. Thank you. Yeah. Well, shall we say farewell until we meet again to hear from Professor Kristen Waters next Sunday, April 3rd. Maria W. Stewart and the Roots of Black Political Thought is, is her topic. And the, and the music that day is Reggie Harris coming to us from upstate New York. Also, don't forget, April 1st is Don White. Um, April Fool's Day, Community Church's Highest of High Holidays. And don't you forget that. Um, Don White will be with us at 7 p.m on the at this same link you can you can hear him or you can go to our youtube channel and hear don on april 1st friday april 1st we have a bunch of other great programs 
Uh, we have had, after that, uh, a whole bunch of films by Afghan young people. Uh, the, the title of the, uh, of the talk is Afghan Voices in Terrible Times, Films and Filmmakers. Uh, Michael Sheridan uh, and, and Afghan filmmakers. After that, we have some Earth Day events. One is Scott Vlaan from Maine, Center for an Ecology-Based Economy. Um, music by Owen Kennedy that day, who is the, the world's foremost songwriter, completely obsessed with birds and bird migrations and bird song. Owen Kennedy, you must not miss Owen Kennedy. And after that, two of my best friends of, of uh, over 40 years, believe it or not. No, 35, let's say 35. Kate Crosby and Laura Burns are both women climate activists on a local level. Laura is from Hingham, Kate is from Acton, and both of them do work on the city level uh, on official city level to, to reduce carbon emissions uh, in the town buildings, town vehicles, town everything. They are really wonderful and uh, the, the, um, activists like you wouldn't believe. Finally, on this newsletter before the next one comes out is May 1st. Steve Kellerman, one of our longtime members and who is presented many times. He's a retired machinist and a historian extraordinaire. And he's going to give us a talk about Eugene V. Debs and the rise of socialism and industrial unionism. Music by Community Voices, our own in-house chorus, me and a few others. Folks, it's been a pleasure to have Joan Ilacqua from the History Project and have Asliani from Joshua Tree National Park and, and the, the world of uh, hip hop and poetry and inner spiritual beauty. Thank you all for joining us. Shall we declare the meeting at the building over? And shall we unmute everybody to give a big applause to Joan and to Asliani? Thank you all. Come join us physically and have pupusas afterwards. They're, they're hot and I can smell them from here. Luis Guzman, our cook, has brought them for us. Let's, uh, let's come down here and you can revel in all these books and in this beautiful auditorium and in Luis Guzman's cooking and care for this building. Thank you, everybody. Joan, we'll see you soon. Asliani, hasta luego. Y que vaya bien y que esté muy bien. And uh, goodbye to everybody. Meeting at the building is over all over this world, all over this world. Ron Elbert, all over this world. Dan the Bagel Man, meeting at the building soon be over. Alvin and YH Pat, Jose Aleman and Joan Livingston, all of you are here with us today, meeting at the building, soon be over, and many more on YouTube, live stream, meeting at the building, soon be over, all over this world. And thank you for you who joined us physically, Dick Crowley and Barbara Crowley and Eli Sussman and Luis Guzman. Thank you and goodbye and have a wonderful Sunday and do good work and keep in touch. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. That was wonderful. Goodbye. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>